think we can do them during the panel. Okay, so sorry, I guess uh, you are hearing me. So um, until now, most of supercomputer are kind of multi-purpose generic. Uh, after having seen uh, you know, the challenges and your taxonomy of different kind of more data, more, how do you see? Do you see a, a future of several different kind or maybe a system that are so smart they can, I don't know, maybe use themselves machine learning to auto reconfigure according to the to the to the workload to the characteristic. I, I'm, I'm really right. curious. Well, you know, I actually do see more diversification in the architecture, and I think one of the things that will enable this is the um, cloud uh, computing because when you when you put things when you centralize computing in that way in a cloud, um, you can you can have specialized parts of it, and you can sort of amortize the cost of that specialization over a larger community of people who might all want to do deep learning or let's say they want to do genomic analysis. And I don't really distinguish in that context between an, a, a system that's put together for science, which is also a large centralized so our HPC servers. There's different economic models between a cloud and between those, but I think that in both cases we may see specialization. The place I see specialization happening the most in science is going to be at the data analysis problem, and it's specifically the streaming analysis that, that's coming from experiments. We already see this in the Large Hadron Collider. You do a certain amount of detection of events right down in the detectors, but once you get the data off the detectors, I think there will also be advantages of having specialized architectures that are looking through images images or genomic data or something to do a certain amount of filtering because we just can't afford to look at everything. Um, it's also, by the way, a little dangerous but to throw stuff away, but I think that that's what we will see is some specialized architectures, um, and I think we'll see it, I think we'll continue to see this kind of big, large amounts of centralized computing in various, various modes. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, if there are no other questions, I really like to thank Kathy again and move on with the agenda. Okay, so going on with the agenda, next we have, uh, you know, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Thomas Cordas from the European Commission, uh, uh, the director uh, for uh, Whatever. I mean, you, you keep changing the name. It used to be excellent science. And now what? It used to be excellent science. Uh, I think he, he will say. Anyway, uh, say. Thomas has a long, long history uh, with the European Commission and before that uh, in France uh, as, a, as a researcher and uh, is now actually uh, a key person because he's leading the European uh, let's say, uh, initiative about uh, exascale. Uh, our politician eventually, thanks to people like Thomas, has been convinced to invest at the level of uh, the other initiatives around the world. And, you know, we have uh, a distinguished set of uh, leaders of the other exascale initiative around the world. And, uh, you know, really, um, really looking forward to a very exciting panel that Thomas has the kindness to accept, to moderate and chair. Thomas, the floor yours. Thank you, Fabrizio. Actually, it's a digital excellence and science infrastructure. Oh, infrastructure. <laughs> okay, I, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Almost got it correct. Anyway, so it's a huge pleasure to be uh, this afternoon with you, and in particular to chair the prestigious panel that we will have in one second, especially after this kind of uh, luminous speech that we had. I'm sure that we will manage to keep your interest high. I would like to start by presenting you the panelists that we have today, starting by Professor Matteo Valero. So I'm sure that you all know Matteo. I'm often using the, 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 the adjectives that are all, 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 I mean, always start by God, the Godfather. <laughs> 
the godmother, the god sister, or whatsoever. <laughs> so the, the godfather, as I said very recently, of our, our developments in Europe. I mean, he, uh, he is there since uh, uh, almost 40 years, if I'm not wrong, Matteo, director of BSC. Uh, he's holding multiple awards, etc. but in particular, he is a person who is still so much motivated about high-performance computing and now high-performance computing strategy in Europe. He will tell about that in a moment, that I'm amazed about his courage and about his enthusiasm on the subject. So our second speaker would be uh, uh, Professor Paul Messina. So uh, again, another leading scientist and leading person in high-performance computing in the States, as you know, uh, Paul is uh, actually the uh, project director at the uh, Department of Energy uh, for the Exascale Computing Project. So uh, again, uh, a, a, a huge career on high performance computing, uh, science director in, 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 in the past, the uh, founder director even of the uh, Caltech Center in Advanced Computing, if I'm not wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then I would like to present uh, our third international speaker, who is, again, another leading um, person in, uh, in high performance computing in his country, so uh, Satoshi Matsuoka. Satoshi is uh, probably, you know very well also Satoshi, he is uh, a leading person in all these uh, petascale computers and their design in, uh, in uh, Japan that start by Tsubame, but the different generations of Tsubame, etc. So with uh, Satoshi participating very often also in many of our activities in Europe, but of course in Japan, not only he's a leading scientist, but he is uh, a, a professor in, uh, um, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, in, uh, in, in high performance, comp I mean, in, in computing architectures, computer science in general. And uh, if I'm not wrong, your, your lab is located or is hosted by the Tokyo Un Institute of Technology, right? Very good. Then we move to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, our uh, Chinese uh, um, host from, from, uh, um, from the international perspective, so the Pei Chan. So Pleased to have you here. Uh, De Pei is a, a professor in two universities, in Baihang and in Sun Yat-sen. Most importantly, he is a leading scientist in one of the leading and uh, um, computing um, projects that are funded by the uh, Chinese uh, research program 863, which is the high-tech program of, uh, of China. So, uh, and he is also a member group of uh, a member of the expert group on the committee of that prestigious program in China. Um, and then I would go back to Europe and we have uh, uh, two uh, uh, leading persons again from Europe in, uh, high, in high performance computing. Uh, Alison Kennedy, who is uh, the uh, director of the um, um, uh, of the Hartley uh, Center in the northwest of England. Alison. And uh, the particularity of Alison is that she is uh, the only member, if I'm not wrong, of our panel, that she is working in a supercomputing center that is at the service of industry. Very good. And uh, last but not least, so we have uh, Per Stenstrom, who is a professor at the Chalmers University of Technology, a very well-known person also for his uh, um, skills and capabilities and knowledge in high-performance computing, participating in numerous uh, conferences and numerous uh, uh, program committees, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, the high expert in Europe on the design of supercomputing uh, architectures, and in particular also focusing on memory performance aspects, etc. So this is our panel for today. So I would like to uh, start with uh, Matteo. Uh, the first part of uh, uh, our panel discussion would be to give you. Uh, the latest status of uh, the different developments in the different countries and in different regions, and then we'll start having some discussion uh, all together. Matteo, is a chance to say about the European <laughs> program, but also the rest, right? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction, but uh, let me tell you that the godfather should be Paul in the state because he's from Italy. I would like to be il capo del reparto. <laughs> so uh, thank you, thank you for inviting me, and uh, thanks to Cathy for the, for the incredible uh, talk you gave us. You 
make our life uh, uh, easy, okay? So when we talk about the speeding computer, I would like to say that 75, uh, 75 years ago, we were able just to compute one operation per second, and now we are able, just one single computer, to, to do 10 to 17. It's incredible. This is a, a only case I know in singularity in the world, okay? So 10 to 10 was done by one processor. We improved the speed of one processor by 10 to 10, and 10 to 7 is the number of processors that current supercomputer use. From now on, probably the only way to go further is to increase the parallelism to have more and more processors. Why we need this, this computer after the, the incredible talk? I don't need to say anything. But uh, I would like, in, 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 in uh, my first uh, uh, part, just to say something, even I will repeat something from Cathy about the, grand, the challenges we have to build this machine, and then I will announce officially once more the European initiative, okay? So the big challenges for me are power, programmability, resilience. But the main, the main challenge we have is how to use the computer we have efficiently. Look at, Cathy said that they improved one, one application by 100. What was the original, the original speed for this application, okay? Yeah, and that happened in many, many applications. We are not using really very well uh, processor. Okay. So power, a serious problem. Let me tell you that in our opinion, 80% of the uh, reduction of power should be given by the technology, new technology, or just building better processor because I mean, you have a, a normal processor. When they do nothing, they, they waste 80%, 70%. We are going down in this, uh, in this uh, ways, but uh, we need to go farther away. And then obviously, if you like to reduce the power, you, need, you have accelerator, I think we are going to talk about that. But if you really don't want to reduce power, the most important thing should, should be do not compute. Why you need to compute? Or if you need to compute, compute with the minimum energy. Okay, so uh, Cathy talked about uh, one of the mechanisms we have, reducing data communication is not just the only one. I think as powerful as this one is the, to do approximate computing. Dynamically, the algorithm, use the number of bits to code information minimum, so you reduce the time, you reduce the energy. By the way, this idea was originally from Barcelona, from one student 15 years ago. Okay, so the second thing is programmability the most important thing to decouple the application from the hardware. We need to give the power to the runtime, and we are doing that at BSE since 20 years ago. And the real revolution should be to change the mentality of the programmers. We can talk about that. Because as Professor Labarta say, probably the person that we will be killed in this scale race will be the programmers. I mean, they are in a very bad situation, okay, because they need to do many, many important things, many of them difficult to do. Resilience, uh, for me, I am very old, resilience is similar to uh, fusion energy to quantum computing. These topics are 50 years ahead, always, okay? But I am joking. If you look, the same happened with that artificial intelligence, and now, due to the, the hardware, due to the computer architects, to the technology, now it's very well uh, used. And uh, quantum computing probably is coming soon. I think we are going to talk about quantum computing. And fusion computing, I would like to talk about the fusion, the fusion, the fusion uh, technology as a real worldwide uh, uh, project. It's the, it's the biggest project where all the countries are collaborating, and this doesn't happen in, in uh, uh, HPC. Okay, architecture, this is my, my field, processor, memory, interconnection network. We are going to a very diverse number of different processors, and the challenge is to homogenize the heterogeneity. We had many, who is going to use this diversity? Another thing is that we need to produce processor if the application uh, can use uh, efficiently, trying to do with less words to do more work. And in this direction, the vector architecture is the best. We don't need to, we wouldn't like to increase the number of threat. We would like to increase the number of operation and can be uh, orthogonal to that, okay? 
So, uh, when you look the current supercomputer dealing with Europe, uh, we are quite good in, uh, in, in writing application, basic software. Linux was originated here. We have tools. We contribute to the programming models. But until now, we lack the, uh, the hardware, OK? We were pioneer designing the R. R now is Japanese. We have many years ago the transputer. They were very good. And during many years, we were unable to build our own technology, OK? So now, thanks to the European Commission, thanks to people as Thomas, we convinced the politician, it's not easy to convince the politician, to devote money, enough money, to try to Europe compete in this exascale rate, okay? So we are, going, we are preparing an FPA now. And uh, I can advise you that uh, we are going to develop an exascale machine based on uh, R, and also looking for the collaboration within this important to collaborate we are going to devote a lot of effort to the RISC-V technology. We did collaboration in Linux, in the software. We do collaboration compilers, whatever. But there is not collaboration in hardware because the companies are competing between them, OK? So probably in five, 10 years, many the, the world will collaborate uh, in, the, in the hardware design based the design on the RISC-V. It's my five cents. Thank you. Paul, what's going on in the States? So Thank you, Thomas. Uh, well, uh, two years ago, almost exactly, we started a project uh, called the Exascale Computing Project. And I, I would say the, the key thing that I would like to um, say about it is that we try to do co-design across the applications, the software, and the hardware. Now, in, in software, I'm including applied mathematics and algorithms. Yeah, because of all the complexities that people have talked about, and, and certainly we see the challenges as parallelism, memory, energy usage, and resilience, nothing uh, innovative there. But because of those challenges, we, we feel that the applications that are trying to do something that they can't do now will be able to identify their requirements in terms of algorithms, in terms of memory size, in terms of balance of uh, memory versus uh, other kinds of movement of the data. Uh, software is an intermediary and can then translate a lot of those requirements in, into tools that enable the effective use of systems. Now with hardware, our approach is to partner with the computer companies. So we, we don't have any experimental design efforts for a new architectures, but we are partnering currently with six computer vendors, so we want to have a lot of variety. And uh, those six vendors meet with us and try to understand the applications requirements and uh, also some of the software requirements. They will provide some of the software, some of the compiler technology. In, in other cases, the compiler technology, as uh, Professor Yellick uh, explained, doesn't exist yet. Uh, perhaps some of it can be developed. Uh, so uh, you know, this co-design approach, uh, I think, is a key feature of our project. Uh, we currently have 25 applications. You saw several of them in uh, Professor Yellick's presentation, uh, spanning by design a very broad spectrum because we don't want to be stuck with only, say, computational fluid dynamics, as uh, important as that is. Uh, we have 66 software projects for the various parts of the software stack. And as I mentioned, uh, six uh, contracts with computer companies currently. Now, our current goal is to have at least one exascale system delivered in 2021, which is just a few years away. And when I say delivered, it would be a system purchased by one of the facilities that traditionally in the Department of Energy uh, fields big systems. Some of those facilities you know, include NERSC, Argonne, Oak Ridge. Now, NERSC won't be one of the first ones because of the breadth of its application uh, community, um, uh, but also the Livermore, Los Alamos, and, and Sandia laboratories. So it's a very short time away. And one reason I mentioned the timing is that means that there isn't time to do anything truly revolutionary, as attractive as that would be. Now, it doesn't mean that what we're developing in terms of applications and software and, and hardware is business as of today, um, but it will not be you know, dramatically different. 
because time is something we can't do much about and you, you, know, you can't just say, well, we will use 10 times as many people and, and we'll be able to develop those things. It takes a lot of time. So, so that gives you a, a feeling for the uh, efforts. Uh, it's intended to, to field production quality systems in a few years and have a lot of applications and a lot of software ready to use it right away productively. Uh, so that's what is driving uh, our efforts. I'll Thank stop you. there. Thank you very much. Satoshi, what's going on in Japan? Well, in Japan, you know, we have traditionally valued uh, real application performances and also other metrics that are important to evolve the systems forward as we you know, go over various generation machines. So um, we have a flagship supercomputer, K-computer, and then we have uh, but other centers that are uh, more tier two, like mainly the university centers, and we formed this coalition called HPCI, which is like based in Japan. And um, ISO centers are also uh, asked not just to adopt K, but to do its own innovation, including my own center uh, 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 at, at Tokyo Tech, at GSIC. Now, um, when you met, look at the metrics of various supercomputers, um, you know, the number one machine in terms of Limpac is owned by China. You know, there are actually two machines. But any other metric, like Green 500, which supercomputer is number one in the world? Well, it's Subami 3, my machine. Which machine is number one in Graph 500? It's the K computer. By the way, uses the algorithm invented by my student. Which machine is number one in HPCG? Well, the K-computer. Which one machine is number one in the um, uh, HPC challenge? Well, it's the K-computer. So in many uh, performance metrics, Japan owns actually the real metrics that are important, power efficiency, um, uh, practical application performances, and so forth. And um, the way we're designing machines for the future, the next generation, um, the post-K and many other machines really reflect this philosophy. So a post-K, which will come online in 2020 probably, I can't really go through details, I'm sorry, um, but uh, sometime uh, fairly early, uh, you'll see this um, uh, very soon, will be, um, uh, will not be an exit flop machine per se, um, but will have tremendous bandwidth in the system. Again, I can't give you the numbers, but we'll have such a tremendous bandwidth in the system that um, we will probably, this, uh, the, the repeat of this, uh, the, our supercomputers being practically number one in many of the applications will actually, uh, this will cycle again. So, um, so this will likely happen, and um, this where a lot of the R&D is going to. And now, and then there are other directions. For example, as many of you know, uh, uh, SoftBank, the Japanese company bought ARM, and also Fujitsu has been very open about co-designing the next generation vector uh, extension uh, instruction set with ARM. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot, uh, the bright side of this is that, uh, you know, previously a lot of the Japanese machines have been sort of enclosed or sort of very vertical in their architectural offerings, is now becoming much more commoditized. So, you know, uh, I, you know, I may expect to see uh, Fujitsu-based ARM processors and, you know, in American machines or European machines or even, even Chinese machines and so forth. Um, the other aspect is that, uh, as was mentioned by Kathy, you know, specialization um, is, would be important. So companies, there are multiple companies building specialized processors and there's a very active field. Like, for example, even Fujitsu is building a, a new uh, deep learning uh, processor that's dedicated to deep learning, which is separate from the K computer processor. And, um, the, and I think this kind of uh, new, um, uh, I think the new movement is to try to build these new ecosystem around our semiconduct uh, uh, ability to design semiconductors. Now, of course, software is important, and um, uh, okay, post K has its associated with it uh, nine strategic areas, and of course, there are multiple applications in these nine areas, and also there are, uh, of, out of which 10 uh, explicit co-design apps have been selected. And we uh, have a very good no uh, feel, we have, in fact, we have very fairly accurate numbers of how, what the speed up of these 
uh, applications are over the K computer, which is, and these applications have a highly tuned over K, so how much speed up we get. And um, uh, the good news is some applications speed up by factor of uh, two orders of magnitude, fact, well, factor of 100. The average being about factor of 30. So, uh, so this is uh, what we expect to see on the post K. And, um, and then uh, there are new applications in data science and also in like artificial intelligence. And we expect to see that these will be accelerated as well on our machines with the advent of new algorithms, but, in, uh, but also in light of the co-design activities that have been conducted. So I think that's the status. And we can talk about some of the other aspects of your question later on. Thank you. We've seen China coming into the two leading countries in high-performance computing the last few years. So what does it mean, and what's coming next? So it's my uh, great pleasure to be here to share the newest development in China. So uh, you might know that uh, in China, everything is in the pace of five years. So since 2002, we have three consecutive key projects on HPC. And uh, currently, we are uh, conducting the new uh, key project on HPC. So that's the fourth one. So the uh, result from the previous three projects are the uh, machines like Sunway machine and uh, uh, Tianhe 2, et cetera, but also include the national uh, HPC environment. We call the uh, national, uh, China National Grid, and also the uh, software, which is uh, supporting the applications. So uh, from uh, 2016, we have the new uh, key project. Under that project, we have three uh, activities. Uh, one is uh, developing the supercomputers, uh, which targeting at the uh, excess scale, uh, uh, excess uh, flops in peak, which is uh, modest compared with the uh, United States and uh, the Japan. And also uh, the uh, HPC application development uh, aiming at uh, develop some uh, applications for uh, critical areas and also for the uh, supporting tools for programming. And then the third activity is HPC environment also to upgrade the same grid, the China National Grid, into a service uh, style environment. So we emphasize the uh, balanced and the coordinated development uh, among the machine, uh, the application software, and also the environment. So under the new key project, we have started uh, 37 uh, projects uh, uh, working on the, the uh, access scale prototypes, the software development, and also the uh, service environment. For the uh, prototypes, we supported three uh, uh, projects led by the Tianhe team, the Sunway team, and also a company called the Sogang. So we require those projects to uh, do experiment on a possible architecture and uh, the key technology solutions toward the, the access scale system. Because you know, currently we, we are at the situation that there is no disruptive technology towards the access scale. We have to do incremental innovation and improvement on the current technology. And there, there is another uh, uh, special, you know, uh, specific uh, problems in China. So we, we have to develop our system using our uh, homegrown processor because of the regulation of import uh, processors. So that means we have to establish an uh, ecosystem for the new processors. Because if we don't have the system software, don't have the tool software, don't have the, the, the application software, it is meaningless to develop the access scale using our own processors. So that's a very, uh, you know, very uh, tough job and a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, tedious work toward the, that ecosystem. So that's one of the special uh, problem in China. And we hope that uh, we can do something jointly with uh, our partners in the United States, in Europe, and in Japan to build up 